Right. Uh, we're talking about entrepreneurship today. And uh, we've got an opinion poll still running here and looking at the total participants. Uh, there's still about... Uh, Okay, almost all of you have voted. We've still got about uh, just four or five folks of the participants in the class who haven't. Um, so if you are just joining, have a look at the poll and it's anonymous. So just pick an answer that instinctively seems to be uh, reasonable to you. I'll leave that open for just a minute or two. So plan of action today. Uh, we're going to talk about the entrepreneurship set of slides. Note to myself here, okay, um, which you already have on Moodle in PDF formats, and so I'll be talking on this. Uh, there's also a, uh, another set of slides that will come very specifically on creativity and adjustment. Um, two thirds about creativity, one third about adjustment, but overall, um, two thirds of the entire topic this week is what you already have the entrepreneurship. So then the creativity discussion, I'll do a uh, to camera piece and um, pull some other material together. And then the adjustment of, is a kind of a conclusions aspect. Um, very important in the context of uh, a lot of economic disruption with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and issues of winners and losers whenever there's a shock from outside the system when there's a shock from inside a market, uh, normally caused by some kind of uh, creative business endeavor, some kind of entrepreneurship. When, when we talk about entrepreneurship later on, we'll talk about ideas such as creative destruction. So the discussion of adjustment is really about the conclusions of the consequences of that. And also under the broad title of adjustment, I'll also raise some of those issues about the status of business and uh, how society deals with, in a sense, the cultural and social sociological um, impacts of entrepreneurship. Uh, I encourage you to watch the videos that are on the website for this topic. We've got a number of them. We've got Vivian Westwood, who fairly recently passed away. Uh, she, of course, has been a very prominent designer and uh, she was um, in a long-term relationship that eventually broke up with a, uh, a very creative music producer called Malcolm McLaren. Now, Malcolm McLaren was the, um, uh, we had various things, he did his music in his own right. Uh, he really played a big role in bringing uh, hip hop to white audiences outside of the United States. But also one of his early business ventures was to promote the Sex Pistols. And so there's a link actually with one of our uh, other uh, people featured on the website there, Richard Branson, uh, because Richard Branson's Virgin Records very early on, one of the, uh, the first mega hits uh, that Virgin Records had uh, was in fact the band, the, uh, the Sex Pistols. And so they kind of go back a long way. Paul Smith as well. Uh, if you look at that interview there, Paul Smith talks about how he started running a, a shop. It was a kind of select shop before there was ever such a thing. He, he kind of talked in terms of an emporium. He started off um, um, selling t-shirts effectively, <clears throat> going down to London in his old car, bringing a heap of t-shirts back up to uh, Nottingham and uh, had a little shop and uh, then started designing t-shirts himself and that put him on the path to being a, um, a fashion designer and a very significant entrepreneur. Both Richard Branson and Paul Smith uh, I think are very interesting because they followed unusual paths. They uh, Neither of them were particularly academically inclined. Um, Paul Smith, for example, he originally was set on being a cycling champion and his father had been a very famous cycling champion, but he had an absolutely horrendous accident and that was no longer available to him as a career, although he still likes to ride a bike. And you see that video actually comes in, he's also on his bike. Um, so he had to do something different. Uh, Richard Branson talks about in the interview that's about 25 minutes long there, how he has always suffered uh, dyslexia, which is a learning disability. Uh, people who are dyslexic struggle to read, for example, and uh, Richard Branson has people always help him out with, um, you know, complex documents, but he has a very clear vision. 
and he openly talks about his learning problems. Uh, school was incredibly difficult for him. He, he did very, very poorly as an academic student, but he was quite good at sport and he ended up kept captaining the cricket team and whatnot. So he's always had a, uh, uh, a love of life and also a strong ability to connect with people, although he's uh, obviously quite shy in some ways too. And he kind of compensates for that in certain ways. So that inter interview is remarkable in terms of reveals how many businesses that he's established and uh, all of those, those personalities are in some sense mavericks. They were upsetting the status quo in a range of industries. They didn't set out to smash things. They just set out to do things in a more interesting way. And uh, there's a very nice comment that Richard Branson makes when he's asked about this. He says very often his business ideas come about from a really bad experience. So actually the way he got into the airline business was he was flying, was supposed to fly to a um, small island in the Caribbean, which he liked very much. And the airline did a sudden cancellation on him and everyone, and they were stuck. And he got together a whole bunch of people who were waiting and said, let's, let's hire an airplane and fly ourselves there and everyone put some money in and he thought oh i could do this and it was his furious um experience with uh, suddenly being abandoned by the airline and several other nightmare flights particularly with um, british airways which is patchy at the best of times um so he thought well i can do better than this and so he started an airline and then that led into so many other businesses now actually richard branson has been fighting for his business survival in recent weeks because so much of his business is actually concentrated around uh, travel uh, including train businesses for example in the UK and lockdown where people couldn't take trains that's that's problematic tourism he actually has cruise ships resorts a whole range of things and um, the British government didn't maybe it's particularly the Conservative Party they didn't step in to support um, Virgin Airlines at all, but they have actually lent money to British Airways, which is, to my mind, yeah, really quite astonishing. Uh, so he's been really fighting for his business survival, and he's had to give a guarantor to banks that if um, loans could not be repaid, then the Caribbean island he first was trying to get to as a tourist, which he ended up buying and uh, is his home for a significant part of the year, he would, uh, he would forfeit that. So he, he's always lived on the edge though. He's nearly gone bankrupt a number of times and uh, given the nature of what he does with philanthropy, which is our final slide in this slide deck, I kind of hope that his business all holds together because he's someone who's been very much focused on using his money for good ends. Um, also, all of them tend to emphasize the importance of actually being really nice to people and dealing with people well. Uh, if you want to survive long-term in business, you can rip people off short-term, but that's not going to get you very far longer term. You're better off being good to people and people want to deal with you and then they'll bring you new opportunities. Um, when we talk about negotiation, we'll, we'll uh, have more insights into this, but there is a very important point that we might emphasize straight away. And that is that a lot of people who really play it hard, who so people who play it really hard in the short term, um, always fighting to win, they often do well in the short term. But so much about business is actually about win-win long-term collaborations. And if you, excuse the expression, screw people over in the short term, they don't forget it. Uh, they say, well, you got me, okay, take my money, uh, but I won't deal with you again. And very often those people who play it hard don't know the costs of their own behavior because you don't see opportunities foregone you don't know about all the opportunities that someone might have brought to you if you'd been nicer to them. Okay. So bad behavior, selfish behavior is actually strangely reinforcing because in the absence of information uh, about the opportunity costs, and uh, that's in our previous set of slides in the opportunity costs of your bad behavior, 
you're very uh, much inclined to think, oh, that's pretty good. I got 60% of the pie. He got 40% of the pie. I'm the man. I'm the pie man. I took 60% of the pie. Meanwhile, um, it's completely lost on you the fact that if you'd actually better communicated information, you could have had a much bigger pie and 50% of a big pie would have been better than 60% of a small pie. And we'll talk further about that in negotiation. It's called distributive versus uh, um, value creation uh, negotiation. Okay, um, we need first of all to get into some definitional issues of entrepreneurship. And I've put these in the slides. I'm going to run the keynote presentation for a while, I'll give this a go. I've had some problems with this in the past, so I've got a backup PDF ready to run. Um, before we do that, I will end the poll now uh, because pretty much everyone's done it. We've got a lot of people joined us. So uh, the results are, I'll show them, but I'll, I'll speak to them first. I'll drag them over here. So 61% uh, of you said the USA, 5% um, of you said Japan, 23% said Sweden, and 11% said South Korea. Okay, um, I think that very much fits with widespread perception that the US is the place of entrepreneurship, of new business creation, of creative destruction. Uh, but actually, a whole lot of data over the last 15 years uh, leads to the fairly strong conclusion that actually the leading country in terms of the four, in terms of new business creation, entrepreneurship, is actually Sweden. So the US is very strong, but Sweden's even higher. And actually, Denmark and Finland uh, are up there as well. So I was even tempted to put Scandinavia, but I think that's, you know, four countries and, uh, as opposed to uh, one for the others. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but there are some interesting reasons for this. And uh, we'll come back to the consequences and the, of entrepreneurship and also the context in which it can happen. But... One of the uh, interesting insights from the Scandinavian experience is that actually good social welfare systems, which are often criticised by right by people on the right wing in politics as say making people lazy and selfish and whatnot, but well designed social welfare systems actually can encourage risk taking. People are less afraid of failure, less afraid of bankruptcy. So people will give it a go to start a new business. And if it doesn't work out, well, you've still got public health. Um, if you get sick, you're still going to be in a world-class medical system. You've got basic, basic uh, living support and whatnot provided by society. If, on the other hand, in a society where many of the key benefits, housing, uh, health insurance, even assistance with education for your kids and whatnot are tied to employment in a company, you're rather less likely to quit and you're rather less likely to, to go out on your own and take risks. So South Korea is an interesting case. South Korea is a, statistically is ahead of Japan. Uh, you do have uh, a number of people who are very keen to be entrepreneurs in the South Korean context, but still overwhelmingly the preference for um, many motivated individuals is to get into a prestigious university, get good grades, try to get into some of those really big companies. Some of the statistics on new business creation in Korea capture businesses created by existing large companies. Uh, the USA, we see a bit of both. Uh, we see new companies uh, popping up by individual entrepreneurial uh, means and with a strong venture finance industry to, to fund them normally after they've been established, not at the very earliest stage. That's, that's often very difficult. We'll talk about that when we talk about finance. Uh, we also do see, of course, big, big enterprises constantly restructuring their companies and creating new businesses, um, sometimes moving existing businesses into them. So actually the statistics are always tricky in trying to make sense of new business formation. Is it really entrepreneurship or is it in a sense a restructuring or an extension of existing large businesses? Japan has a relatively small um, startup sector for a range of reasons. Generally, if you graduate from Waseda, um, 
you find it quite easy to get a job in an interesting company that gives you a good career path. So you're less likely to be entrepreneurially driven. And there's a range of things which you know, make being in small business a challenge in Japan, being in a startup a challenge. Um, elementary things like the tax system, that actually if you have a good first year, you get suddenly hit with a huge, uh, what's called provisional tax bill. Because you made this amount of money this year, uh, you therefore have to pay tax for next year in advance based on how much you paid this year before you even make the money next year. Uh, and there's no guarantee that money will actually come. So actually lots of businesses have cash flow problems, not because the expenses are running ahead of their receipts, but because the tax man wants to get paid before the business has even been paid. This happens to individuals too, by the way. Um, I teach a side gig at KO and this last year, the tax office sent me a, a tax bill um, for advance payment of taxes before I'd ever taught a single class at KO. So the government got them, got money from me before I ever got it from KO. Uh, so a lot of those little things all impact on whether it's a friendly environment to do business or not. So I'll end the poll and I'll share the results with you so you can see them yourself. So those of you who picked the USA, 60% uh, of you, don't be discouraged. That um, means you have a good instinctive feel for the dynamism there. And we, of course, understand that many of the really prominent companies that provide, in a sense, the particularly the digital architecture of our everyday lives, you know, Facebook, Google, um, Uber Eats, so many places. So, um, I was in... Uh, reluctantly in McDonald's this morning uh, after having been in my office well past dawn and reluctantly eating McDonald's for breakfast and was amazed to see how many Uber Eats delivery uh, riders there were collecting McDonald's for people for breakfast. I think it's one thing to eat it on the way home after an all-nighter. It's another thing to wake up in the morning and go, McDonald's, that's what I've got to have to start my day. But anyway, Uber Eats is, uh, and Uber in general has been obviously one of those companies that um, with a little bit of, to, to use the Yiddish expression, chutzpah, um, cheeky boldness, just, uh, just to go ahead and start this business and who cares what the rules are about taxis and whatnot, has created the largest um, global platform, of course, for share ride services and uh, then has been leveraged into other businesses. So we see so many of these uh, brands and platforms that are changing the way we experience the world have come out of the US. Many of, very often they're created by um, entrepreneurs, you know, Elon Musk. Uh, we saw last week his uh, space business, um, was uh, provided the first uh, successful private, uh, privately run for-profit uh, space mission to, to shuttle um, astronauts to the International Space Station on behalf of NASA. NASA, in terms of the buy or make decision, has decided to buy rather than to make. And so we see a number of businesses have been getting into this. Um, Richard Branson as well. And if you watch the uh, the video online, you can see that he's uh, got, uh, ha has had a uh, aspirational space joyride business. And we'll see what becomes of, of that and a range of other things. So yes, the USA are uh, incredibly entrepreneurial. And what's particularly striking is that the sheer scale of the US market and financial system that allows money to flow into promising startups means that many of these businesses can scale up very rapidly. And indeed, when they build a business, people are always looking for what we call scalability. Uh, in a previous class, we have scale and scope. Uh, so scalability means the ability to, to scale it up. And particularly in our digital era, we see this. Um, Zoom, we're all on Zoom. Um, Zoom has been astonishing in its ability to keep up. Um, it's now something in terms of its user base 50 times larger than it was a few months ago. So it's very clear with COVID-19 that there are winners and losers. Zoom, of course, um, has made it possible for universities to 
effectively keep running classes. Yeah, without Zoom and uh, equivalent services, collaborate and whatnot, which is built into Moodle. Without those, those basic uh, platforms, uh, we would have just had to suspend semester. Uh, so some of you may have liked that. Uh, there would have been a whole lot of um, implications of that. But without those entrepreneurs that were creating those platforms, uh, we would have had a very different experience of a pandemic. So I'll go over now to the keynote presentation. And give me a shout out quite literally, unmute and say, it's not working if the slides freeze because that has happened before. Okay, now I know, you're probably wondering, what is this? This is an enormous spotlight, actually, uh, that was, uh, it's, it's in Finland, in Helsinki, and it's a, uh, it's a spotlight that was originally used by the Air Force to spot bombers, okay, to try and shoot down foreign, foreign bombers. Uh, I just, uh, I don't know, I, I just mental thought, uh, you know, put a spotlight on entrepreneurship. But actually, the, uh, the other reason why I made a connection with this was uh, when I was digging around in my photo roll, for an image, I was originally looking for an image of a place called Cableworks in um, Helsinki. That's a very interesting space. It used to be a major cable manufacturing uh, factory on the outskirts of Helsinki, and they, uh, the cable business effectively uh, was shut down, although the associated business, uh, Long, long associations with um, Nokia that went for a while was a very dominant firm in terms of mobile phone businesses. Um, but the cable works, the old factory is uh, like so much great uh, Finnish architecture, had heaps of windows, lots of light. And so the building itself was repurposed as a combination art space and also business, a business and cultural incubator space. And it's a very interesting place to go to. So anyway, what's entrepreneurship? Well, there's a number of definitions and descriptions, and you'll see that I've put a slide here as well towards the end, which says that we often use the term entrepreneurship also in relation to non-profit oriented things. So we can talk about someone being very entrepreneurial. And there's even a whole theory of political entrepreneurship where it's the, effectively use a uh, economics inspired um, market space model and uh, understand political behavior by, by politicians as in some sense being entrepreneurial, trying to win, win supporters by mixes of policies and raising funds and, and whatnot. But we can use entrepreneurship also to apply to things like the Catholic Church, religious organizations. And uh, uh, when we talk in particular about the kind of personality that tends to be very suited to entrepreneurial endeavor, we see that there is a kind of alertness element there, that people see opportunities and that those opportunities or that, that, that mindset or that, that personality type uh, equally can function in politics, can function in charities, in a, in a whole range of areas. So typically the academic work of entrepreneurship tends to focus on things I've got like in the slides here, what we call decision making under uncertainty. This notion of uncertainty is very significant. We draw a distinction between uncertainty and risk. And we will come back to that uh, in the finance discussion. Uh, but the critical thing with uncertainty is the def definitionally, uh, it defies prediction. Uh, those of you taking the Designing Corporate Communications course, an intermediate course, would have heard me speaking about this yesterday. But there is this notion that it has emergent properties, that the world is not like a stable fixed machine, of course, with many parts. And once we understand how the parts and interact with each other, we can make perfect predictions. For a long time, people wanted to believe that was the case, that the world was a stable state, completely stable state. And all we needed was more data, better analysis, better models, and more information about the machine, in a sense. 
we now understand very well, and this is actually surprisingly recent in terms of academic modeling, um, we now understand over the last 20, 30 years that actually so much of our society and its, and its evolution really does defy, quite literally defies prediction. It has emergent properties. Now, how do we for so long end up with a notion of a stable state? Well, it's because largely the model of scientific research was influenced in relation to this, the human sciences, the social sciences, was inspired by the natural sciences. And the natural sciences uh, saw the world very much as in a complex, but a stable state. Now we know all know with things like global warming and whatnot, that that uh, notion of a completely stable state was exaggerated. But elementary things like actually blasting a spacecraft uh, into orbit and having it dock with the International Space Station, as I mentioned yesterday in another class, uh, that of course shows that there is a whole lot of things that happen in the world with the causality is well understood that it is quite stable and we can, we can plan on that basis. But there are other elements of complex systems, and we often speak about complex adaptive systems, as so societies adapt, and we'll talk about adaptive, adaptive efficiency later on in the course. Uh, there are constant emergent properties. So, of course, this pandemic, we all know about the risk of pandemic. The, there are thousands of epidemiologists who study this, they've studied past pandemics but each one has distinctive impacts and we're seeing very significant impacts on business. And uh, you'll be thinking more about that when you do your group work, which by the way, I will be updating you at the end of the week. So anyway, we have several distinctive schools of thought on entrepreneurship and each of them emphasizes different aspects. There's no one model that is the best model. They are quite complementary. So first of all, we tend to think of entrepreneurship and innovation as often, you know, uh, complementing each other. That, in a sense, on, entrepreneurs drive innovation. That innovation is a good thing. That the world is a more uh, becomes a better place. By the way, this is a uh, uh, this is Valentino, uh, one of the Italian uh, fashion entrepreneurs, and we see many others. Tom Ford. So many people. Quite interesting. Uh, it, it's quite easy to create new businesses in fashion. It has low entries to low, low barriers to market entry and whatnot. And that's something we'll come back to. Uh, we often, often assume that entrepreneurship leads to innovation, but it's not always the case. Some entrepreneurship, which might be very clever, very profitable for the people involved can have negative social impacts. You know, we don't think that drug cartels uh, effectively create new demand for an illegal substance such as heroin, yeah, we don't think that that's socially beneficial entrepreneurship. So there is a lot of bad entrepreneurship out there as well. It's about picking the good from the bad. Under some conditions, the uh, good will displace the bad. And that's what we saw with Richard Branson being highly motivated to try and make the world a better place through bringing better services to market. Under some conditions, we do see that the bad displaces the good that uh, the high, higher quality, maybe more ethical producers can't compete with the lower quality ones. And under some conditions, this is a frequent problem, especially when customers cannot tell in advance uh, the quality of something. And of course, customers are not stupid. If they experience lots of bad quality products, uh, yes, they would like to buy a higher quality product from in that market and would be prepared to pay for it. But if they can't find the higher quality product, they can't separate it from the lower quality product, then they won't buy at all. And there's a whole theory on this called the market for lemons. A lemon is a uh, kind of casual American expression for a bad car that the, uh, the secondhand car market is generally underdeveloped because cars are really complex things. It's very difficult when you buy a secondhand car to be confident that you're getting one in good condition rather than one in bad condition. It's too easy to hide the problems. As a consequence, generally secondhand cars sell for less than they should on average based on their quality. Uh, 
because it's hugely hit and miss whether you get a good or bad one. So there is a in, intrinsic advantage to selling new cars because of uncertainty about secondhand cars. And if you think about buying a, a secondhand computer from someone, you have exactly the same kind of concern. So not all business makes the world a better or more refined place. And as I say here, the silly can succeed. This is a picture in Stockholm, uh, lots of entrepreneurs. Um, if you look at that bizarre cutter cutter in the background, uh, Anyone who travels abroad will know that uh, strange takes on aspects of Japan turn up in various places. It's quite exotic, and uh, but you know it can succeed if it makes you money. Okay. Now, looking at our key theoretical approaches, uh, this is the most established. I, th and I, I think many people think uh, this is the the nature of entrepreneurship that it involves risk taking. Okay, uh, and very valid and realistic perspective. Of course, risk taking is a significant factor which differentiates between being in business to being employed. Simply put, the costs come before the revenues and there's no guarantee that the revenues will come. Now, going to work for a company involves some costs as well. You know, if you, you're doing shukatsu, uh, yeah, you yeah, have to, no, you don't have to, but you might. Um, go to Alki suits and buy one of their suits and um, buy uh, those, yeah, those black suits that you probably should burn as soon as your shoe cuts is finished, unless you want to save it for a funeral. Uh, and everyone then buys the, the same shoes and the same bags and the, uh, the same white blouses and whatnot. Uh, so you have those upfront expenses. A lot of people don't want to bear too many expenses, so they only buy one suit and those of you, there's a few people here who are third year students um, or beginning fourth year students. So know the, uh, that now with job interviews starting in June, suddenly on a hot day like today, maybe three days in a row, if you've only got one black recruit suit, you've got to work three days in a row. And by the end of the week, it starts to get a little bit smelly, okay? Um, by the way, I had one Zimmy say who went and bought a very beautiful blue suit rather than a, a black suit and uh, for shoe cuts and went to a job interview and every time, and cause it happened several times, he was asked about, Hmm, you're wearing a blue suit. Uh, he replied, um, I bought a suit to work, not a suit to get a job. Okay. Uh, no. And it went extraordinarily well for him. In some cases, it became a talking point. And I've had Zemi say who've absolutely refused to, to do the recruit suit thing too as a point of differentiation. But it takes a certain confidence to do that. By the way, I had Italian uh, students visiting in a group uh, last year in the spring and uh, they came on campus just around the time that there was lots of uh, Kaisha Setsumekai company uh, information sessions. And these Italian students, of course, Italians, uh, they're, they're great lovers of fashion. And they said, does Wasada have a uniform and require people to wear it? I said, no, why do you think that? And they said, they said but everyone is wearing the same black uniform. I said, no, they're job hunting. And they were quite traumatized by the thought of that <laughs> in, in Italy. If you turned up in the same suit as someone else in, uh, uh, had the interview before you, neither of you would get the job. Okay. Anyway, there, there are some costs in advance. If you think about going to university for four years, that's actually investing in your human capital, delaying your job hunting. Uh, but it's not like the risk taking that we get in uh, business in general, particularly if you go to Wasada, you're pretty confident that the returns on a Wasada degree are high. So it's a pretty safe, safe bet. Okay. Um, this broader point about costs come before revenues. That's the downside for business. The positive element is the upside. And this is an important term in corporate governance. Um, we've had, total of eight presentations on corporate governance. So you're probably thinking, oh, not more governance, but this is a key thing, this notion of residual claimants. So after all the losses have been borne and revenues have, have um, come into a company, what's left over belongs to the owner of the business. People who created the business or subsequently bought the business, if they bought shares in it, they have what we call the residual claimants 
to any residual surplus. Um, and this is a key, key concept. Another thing I want to emphasize is that we tend to think of risk taking as at the beginning of an enterprise, that you've got costs up front and then later on the revenues come. And very often businesses take about two years before they break even or start or, or do better, start to make a profit. If you're really lucky, business is profitable right from the beginning, but that's a that's rare. Um, there are certain kinds of businesses uh, that have that possibility, generally with low upfront costs, uh, lots of revenues, but most of the costs have been upfront costs, but we tend not to immediately think of them. So they're in your terms of your education. So being a consultant, for example. Okay. Now, we tend to think of risk as being at the start of a business, uh, but market forces are constantly working. And we talked a lot about markets in an earlier week. So this competitive pressure means that you're always facing new uh, rivals coming into the market. And as soon as you do something well, other people are going to try and copy it. Okay. And so we see this in so many fields that you're inviting competition with your success, which means that you have to keep innovating. You have to continue very often to take risks, to promote innovation. And this of course leads to economic dynamics as a whole. The scholar most associated with this view of entrepreneurship is risk-taking is a guy well dead now. Um, well, bad for him that he's dead, but a long time ago. Um, he was a professor at the University of Chicago guy called Frank Knight. And we sometimes refer to this as the Knightian view of entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship is risk taking. But there's an, an immediate qualification. Of course, when we talk about finance, this will be clearer to you. But actually, one of the key features of finance these days, the finance markets uh, and financial instruments is that modern capitalism shares risk. So they, they price and distribute risk. And this makes entrepreneurship much easier. So if you're issuing shares, that raises capital, okay? You're sharing the risk with others. So if you don't issue shares, you bear all the risk in your business. So if you want to fund your business with bank loans, uh, you will probably have a lower cost of capital because generally banks demand a lesser return on a loan, a lower interest rate than shareholders do because if you take risk, you have to get paid for it. This is something we'll talk about more about in finance. If people want you to share in the risk of something, make sure you're getting paid for it. Now, we often see people, uh, some smart but not nice people, are very good at figuring out how they become the residual claimant, how they, they pick up the profits, but if there are losses, they shift the losses onto other people or onto society as a whole. And that's a conversation we'll have later. So if you're doing a project with someone, ask them, is the upside shared or only the downside? Of course, the personal financial risk for entrepreneurs are reduced because you can share risk through uh, financial markets. You can issue shares in your company, for example. So we need to go beyond just financial risk taking uh, to understand entrepreneurship. Even if you could share all the financial risks, though, there are, there are still lots of other risks. And so it's still a very relevant model. Uh, risk to reputation. You know, it's, it's not nice to have gone bankrupt. Uh, personal bankruptcy uh, has a lot of negative implications. And we will talk about, actually, uh, your credit worthiness and the rise of the credit um, rating business, for example, when we talk about finance. Now, there's a, a very different approach to entrepreneurship, which is often referred to as the Austrian school or the Vienna school related to where Joseph Schumpeter came from. He was Austrian and he actually started writing about this before World War II. Uh, like many other scholars, he ended up in America uh, after World War II. So he really focused on the economic consequences of entrepreneurship. His, he was interested in how uh, capitalism is made dynamic by entrepreneurial uh, behavior. So he was interested in the drivers of innovation and his name is deeply associated with the study of both, both entrepreneurship and innovation and particularly his description of what he called creative destruction. 
And you'll see this in so many contexts. There was a lot of discussion in late 1990s Japan with so many big companies that were failing, um, that overgrown in the bubble, and then they had new competitors challenging them, for example. You know, we saw department store businesses going and uh, chain stores going bankrupt because they couldn't face the competition from startups such as uh, Yanai Sun's fast retailing, Uniqlo. So this notion of creative destruction, that entrepreneurship uh, brings innovation, but there are losers as well. So it's destruction, but it's a positive destruction even though if you lose your job, it's, it's not very positive, okay? It's not very satisfying to saying, hmm, to tell yourself you've been creatively destroyed, okay? Schumpeter has also made a very significant contribution in terms of thinking about the social foundations of entrepreneurship. Under what conditions do people decide to, to take on risk, to be an entrepreneur, to try to create a business? So we then shift our focus to another model of entrepreneurship, and this is entrepreneurship as arbitrage and uh, arbitrage is a word that's very often used in finance so it's got a finance finance orientation okay so simply put arbitrage is taking advantage of market imperfections it uh, means that you buy something cheap in one market and sell it higher in another market there's a whole lot of people doing kojin yunyu. So private importers are looking to do this. You can buy something in one market cheaply, uh, you can sell it in, a, in another market, uh, and you can make a profit. So unfortunately, we've seen this with masks during COVID-19, but we see it with iPhones, for example. You, uh, in some countries, iPhones are much more expensive than other countries. So you get the buckle guy effect, people going and buying a whole lot of them when the new model comes out and taking them to another country and selling them for a profit. We, we see that in so many, so many areas. Now, the important thing with this arbitrage is that uh, economists look at arbitrage as a mechanism for what we call price equalization. That uh, if fish in Thailand are dramatically cheaper than Japan, lots of people see the business opportunity to import fish from Thailand to Japan. Uh, this means that the fish, rather than being sold in Thailand, will be sold more and more in Japan, which means supply and demand in Thailand. The, let's assume the demand stays the same, supply reduces because it's going to Japan. So effectively, prices in Thailand will rise. And as more fish come into Japan, market prices will fall. So economists actually look at price data and look at the, the degree of things like price convergence as some macro level way of understanding what's happening with, with trade. So when you can no longer get things locally uh, because they're all sold out, they're in strong demand, there is an entrepreneurial response. Um, I'm acutely aware of this. Uh, right now, there are some really awful people who should be kicked off Amazon, but aren't quickly enough looking to engage in horrible arbitrage. Things that um, currently are sold out in Japan, they've bought some from abroad and they're trying to sell them for very high prices. Now, clearly, of course, masks was one of them, but a whole range of things like um, video capture cards that gamers use for streaming their, uh, their video games to YouTube, for example, are in huge demand by people like me who want to use a digital camera uh, to actually stream video to YouTube or to, to make uh, video on demand content. And so you've got a bunch of people who are buying them up overseas, trying to sell them in Japan for three to four times the market price because they know that people are really, really desperate to get these kind of things. So that to some degree could bring about um, equal, um, an equilibrium of prices. But there's another, another point about arbitrage. In its purest form, technically, it's actually risk-free. So this is a finance view. So we shouldn't assume that finance always just talks about risk. Um, because you could simultaneously buy and sell uh, with price differentiation and be confident that you're not actually um, taking on any risk uh, if you are across two markets. So it's a sure bet, okay? Under conditions of information asymmetry, for example, this is possible. We'll come back to this when we talk about information. Now, the arbitrage view has been associated with a number of scholars, Liebenstein and Kirzner, 
But Kirzner is also very important for this notion of entrepreneurial alertness. Uh, he sees markets as imperfect and he sees people who succeed in, in business as very often always looking for the angles, seeing the opportunities, being very quick to, to say, hmm, maybe, the, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe there's some money to be made here. You know, a shortage is a signal to the alert person that there is a potential business opportunity. So I just want to skip back and one line summary of these different views. Um, risk is, sorry, whoops, sorry, back, right. The risk taking view. So this is uh, the starting point we have, okay? We then recognize that finance actually overcomes some of the financial risk, but reputation risk is, is still at work there. Skip through this, sorry. Okay, then there's the innovation view. The innovation view uh, effectively emphasizes that markets are disrupted. It's a positive disruption, but markets are disrupted. The arbitrage view kind of says the opposite, that actually markets tend to come closer to equilibrium. So the previous one, I'll go back again, is a disequilibrium view, that you upset uh, the equilibrium through creative destruction. So, for example, Sony was the dominant producer of televisions in the old um, Brankan, cathode, cathode ray. Um, then what we effectively saw was new technologies, uh, um, and uh, plasma TVs disrupted the market. Okay. And Sony uh, never really recovered its leadership position. This, on the other hand, brings markets closer to equilibrium. Uh, then there's this broader point about entrepreneurial alertness, and it all assumes that markets are imperfect. And Kirzner is open-minded. It could sometimes be equilibrium producing. It can sometimes be disruptive. So there's another approach, a more recent approach, Mark Casson's approach, which really focuses on decision-making under uncertainty, to judgment under these uncertain conditions. And this approach became influential because uh, in a lot of the discussions of entrepreneurship, of course, they only focus on people who own the business. But the reality is so many of the businesses these days are run by people who don't own it, but are employed managers. And also so much transformation in business was happening, effectively employees making tough decisions about what to do with a the company. There's also a notion of intrapreneurship. This is the idea that uh, you can have a entrepreneurial culture inside of companies and generate new businesses. So we sometimes see businesses deliberately trying to do this. Um, Mitsubishi uh, Corporation, for example, has tried to promote this in a range of ways. Hakuhodo has a scheme where they employ young employees to propose new business models and they pick the most promising two each year and provide um, some funding and give them, uh, say, three years to see if it will work. So more and more businesses doing this. So generally, entrepreneurship can bring strong rewards. Um, we understand that, and it's a strong motivation. So where to start being an entrepreneur? Well, often a niche strategy. If you know something well and serve a particular market, but of course, it, it, you have to be in the right place. This is a, I, I just took this in a picture of a window in a um, boutique furniture restoration supply shop in Italy, okay? Now, in uh, the Italian context, lots of people have inherited antique furniture from their families and want to keep it in the family. And yeah, this, this supports a whole store like this. Um, maybe in a huge city like Tokyo, maybe just, but overwhelmingly in Japan, it's a very sky steer kind of culture. People buy and discard. And so I can't imagine, um, this really surviving as an independent business. It might as an online business, and that's a critical thing, that there are so many niche businesses that survive as an online business. Um, more likely in the Japan context, it just ends up as one corner of Tokyo hands. So successful entrepreneurs, um, typically they've just, oh, I'm sorry, there's a mistake, they had a hunger for success and tried and often failed. The, uh, the tale of McDonald's um, is one of these, and you can see a movie about it or they've had a very deep experience and love for a particular industry. And 
these are more likely to succeed actually. Uh, you may know the Lonely Planet Travel Guide publications. These were a couple that traveled overland from England to Australia. Um, they took notes and then they wrote it up and published a book and then it became the most uh, uh, widely used travel guide. Then they had a big challenge transitioning to the digital era. Billabong, created by surfers. I have a very strong attachment to the Billabong brand. It was created down in a place where I used to love and to go and watch surf competitions on the Gold Coast when I was young, um, just in Burley Heads. Um, out of sentimental reasons, I bought shares in Billabong at $14 a share. And um, when eventually the company was almost bankrupt and bought out by um, an investment fund, I think I got five cents per share back. Uh, one of my um, painful lessons is if you love a product, don't buy shares in a company that make the product, just buy the product, okay? Burton Snowboards, we know about this. I'm going to, I'm still in the process of editing, um, give you two videos. One that talks about the rise and fall of the um, ski field business in the bubble era in Japan, and another one very specifically in the, um, the snowboard business kind of context. Anyway, a critical thing for entrepreneurship is networks. Uh, the ability to connect with other people becomes critical. We see that that's a, a key success factor in business. So this leads to a discussion of the sociology of entrepreneurship. Under what conditions do they emerge? Sometimes it really helps to be well-connected, old school. You know, you went to Oxford with someone and, you know, you can call in your networks. More often, though, we see that really successful entrepreneurs often had no other option. After war, they were displaced. Migrants who didn't have regular careers because their skills weren't recognized. My favorite Vietnamese pho beef noodle soup. Every time I go back to Brisbane, I go to the place, it's still magnificent. The guy who founded it was a um, Vietnamese refugee um, from the Civil War in Vietnam, and he was originally a doctor. Um, Given how beautifully he slices the uh, the beef, I suspect he was a, he was a surgeon or something. Okay, and he couldn't practice as a doctor in Australia, so he started a restaurant. And uh, for decades now, I've been making people extraordinarily happy. And if anyone's going to Brisbane, I can tell you where it is. It's just magnificent. So minorities who are persecuted: Jews in Europe, Chinese in Southeast Asia, Quakers in England, for example, uh, disproportionately went into business because they couldn't do other things. So successful entrepreneurs, they create demand for other services. And so it's easy to fault them, and particularly when they become so rich. But the more they get out and spend, um, the better. Okay. Um, so if you're afraid of failure, don't worry too much. As I've got a picture here, you, that cruiser would be worth more than probably one of the most expensive houses in Tokyo. Um, but those guys still look pretty happy fishing off the rocks there. Okay. Um, strikingly, many entrepreneurs who make an enormous amount of money actually choose to not really spend it. They live simply and they continue to work hard. So it's actually the satisfaction of the business rather than just get, get uh, making money. And indeed, many of the people who go into business just to make money, I want money, don't do very well. So you've got to have a passion for something, first of all. And to just give you one final example, someone who lived very simply, um, a guy called Muller, um, who inherited from his father a very small shipping company and built it into Maersk, that I've already mentioned it earlier, um, one of the world's largest shipping companies, uh, donated something like 800 million euros or something for building of this Copenhagen Opera House um, right on the waterfront there. Now, he used to live in a small house and drive a second-hand car and whatnot, but he gave an enormous amount of money away. We see this, the Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation is doing amazingly good things in investing in medical research, in developments in Africa, particularly focusing on AIDS and more recently with COVID-19, for example. So they're the set of issues. Um, now, with the remaining time, we've got around about 15 minutes. Uh, what I'd like to do is to um, put you into breakout rooms for a little bit and uh, just say hi to each other. It's a chance to, to connect a little bit with your classmates from all over the place. Um, and as I said in my email to any message to you all through Moodle, uh, to identify some entrepreneurs, or if you can't remember their name, the business that's associated with them, um, and why you kind of admire them, and maybe talk a little bit about issues, just the you know, why, why they succeeded and are they in danger of failing? Uh, so just share that amongst yourselves and 
then at least one person, or probably the simplest thing to do is kind of everyone after the discussion, is then just tap out your, uh, your suggestions in chat and I will capture all that. By the way, I've captured all the stuff on the uh, what makes a good uh, coffee shop and I've got that as a file and I'm kind of editing it in a way so that everyone can look at the, the summary of their views. So uh, this is inherently interesting, but it also helps me very much as I'm fine tuning our own um, exercise that you'll be doing in groups and which I'll, I'll release to you at the end of the week. So I'm gonna throw you now into some breakout rooms, okay? Okay, so everyone, yep, put your entrepreneurs into chat, just tap the names out, the ones you mentioned yourself, and maybe a quick reason. Um, at very least, give us the name of the person. So um, I wanna end up with a very nice data set on who you think is, is interesting. And you know, if you if any of you like the or have an interest in bad entrepreneurs, that's okay too. There are some pretty amazingly evil but very successful people out there. Um, I have people who immediately yep, oh Jack Ma, no, he's a good guy. Mara Jack Ma. Um, Pablo Escobar, for example, who was a who was a crime boss. Adnan Khashoggi was a very famous arms dealer. Uh, there's uh, a bunch of people who sometimes have a bit of an unfairly bad reputation. Uh, if anyone's got Prime, I think I mentioned this once already, if you've got Amazon Prime, there's a fantastic doc, kind of documentary, half drama, half documentary series on Hugh Hefner, um, American Playboy, the guy who founded the Playboy Network. Um, he actually did a huge amount to promote um, racial equality in America. People tend to think of him as just all centerfolds and nudes and you know, Playboy culture and whatnot, it was that. But actually, he supported large numbers of writers, musicians, intellectuals, um, particularly African American and whatnot. So, right, okay, a whole bunch of really interesting people. Keep them coming. Fantastic. Uh, one of the uh, the really interesting conclusions from lots of studies of entrepreneurs is most of them can be difficult people at times. Um, you know, the kind of drive or determination that uh, that you need often to succeed in business um you're gonna you're gonna have conflicts with people uh but if you don't have that you're just going to be too easily maybe distracted or discouraged and also taken advantage of so you know the <laughs> excuse you kind of a strange expression you know you, you need a bit of the mongrel in you you know you do you know the the the, the kind of the savage dog um but it's interesting when you talk to entrepreneurs and so many people who deal with them, even though we know these stories of Steve Jobs, for example, who could be very difficult and he could be very kind of almost you know, cruel to people at times, um, condescending when they did a poor job, but he still really valued talent. And one of the things that Steve Jobs really emphasized was always hire people that are smarter than yourself. And I think one of the biggest problems in large organizations is that bosses don't like smart junior employees and they often make it more difficult. So entrepreneurs, on the other hand, generally recognize that the smarter the people you find, the more your business can grow. And because they are the residual claimant, they get to benefit from this. Um, you know, I've I had several bizarre situations in the last couple of years. My most brilliant students, two of my most brilliant students, um, GPAs 3.95, 3.98. And one of them was on the Dean's list. The other one should have been, but got a bizarre grade from a professor who probably was asleep when he graded the exam, something like that. Um, neither of them, their shoe cuts went very well. So I introduced them to a friend of mine who's an entrepreneur who's got a startup successful consultancy business and he immediately employed them and they were super happy there. And one of them, she's gone on now to Paris um, to do a business program, a master's degree. And the other one still works for my friend with a branding consultancy. And um, he pays her so much better than Japanese companies do. So, so you'll often see that some of the most talented people for some bizarre reason, just, well, it's not bizarre. Um, often companies think, mm, 
maybe this person is too smart, maybe difficult to use or a little bit intimidating or whatnot or the people interviewing. Um, and particularly guys sometimes have a problem with really intelligent, talented women. All the, all of the people I'm talking about were women, by the way. So unfortunately, we often find that big organizations are hesitant to use the best people. And so you're really left with no choice but to either um, put up with lesser opportunities or to go and make your own. And I, I hope you all go out there and, uh, and, and do that. So uh, keep all, the, oh, there were some really good details here. So keep them coming. I'll leave the uh, meeting open for a while. Um, right until, um, let me see, we're getting uh, got a little bit of time um, left here, so we can keep it open for a while. Um, where are we now? We're at uh, two fifteen, so we can we can run on a little a uh, little bit longer. So I do plan to finish up the class a little bit um, earlier today because of the transition to another class that that comes. Okay, so I'd, I'd like to speak to some of the names that we're seeing coming here. Wow, okay. Okay. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, very interesting case. Uh, Harvard guys initially started off a, uh, a messaging system, very closed model. The idea was um, only for Harvard students and then for other elite students. Uh, to mix with each other and then other people wanted to join and then they uh, they took something that originally wasn't exactly a business initiative and uh, decided to open it up and then it just exploded to the point where now there's over two two billion users um, internationally and of course an enormous enormous influence so um, some of the interesting businesses come about uh, by accident and then people will recognize these emergent properties. Uh, there are a lot of businesses that have funny names that don't seem to fit um, the uh, name of what they do these days. Um, I know two Belgian guys who are branding consultants and their company is in Tokyo is called Trainspot. And they thought, why Trainspot? Uh, the story is that uh, they originally had an idea to, no one was doing it in Japan, to completely fit out trains with advertising campaigns, so a spot on a train. And they developed the business very effectively. They were both actually trade promotion officers for the Belgian government. They decided to do this. Then, I can't name the company exactly, but someone completely ripped off their idea and took it, and they had more powerful connections. And so they stole the business from them. Uh, so they had to do something else, but they already had created the company Trainspot. And so that's what they ended up doing. Um, my friend with a branding consultancy, the company is called User Cure Day. Uh, no, User Cure Day. Now, the company actually was started to brew a Yuzu drink in Japan to export to the German market. Okay, right to the point where I even actually connected them um, with a former student who was actually working for a boutique uh, brewer. And then some other kind of things happened, but the bright young Germans involved were several of them, particularly one of them, the founder, was working for branding consultancies. And one of the branding consultancies had, had a scandal and had to shut down, was shut down by its parent in London. And all the clients, uh, wanted the work to be done. And so they said to Sven, um, will you work for us? And said, okay, <laughs> radio, I'd love to keep working with you. Um, and they said, now we need to pay you. Uh, do you have a company? He says, well, I do. And, but it was originally to brew user soft drinks and he says, okay. And so anyway, now, now user Kilde is a branding consultancy. So these funny things happen. Okay. So now here's a quiz for you. DHC, um, famous for its Sapodi business, and they have a resort down in Izu, and they take deep sea water, and you can soak in it and all the rest of it. So DHC, does any, and don't Google it, don't cheat. If you Google it, you can find it, don't cheat. Does anyone know what DHC stands for? Yeah, it stands for uh, Daigaku Honyak Center. Thank you. Someone knows that fence. Daigaku Honyaku Center. Okay. It actually started out as a business um, providing translation services for Japanese professors who got kakenhi. 
So research funds, and when you get in, you're pressured to publish internationally, uh, but writing in English is really hard work. So they started up the business to provide translation services. So that's why Daiga Kohonya Kusenta um, became DHC, and then they saw Sapodi opportunity, so using the acronym. So, so many businesses start off as one thing, and then the business shifts in another direction. And so they either have to rename the business or typically they go to acronyms. So Ernst & Young, for example, becomes become E and Y. And now they were an accounting firm on a, organized on a partnership basis and they're incorporated or be consultancy. So making your name E and Y uh, became more common. So here's another one, AGC, AGC. A really famous company, but I first of all was like AGC, AGC, what's that? Now they've recently renamed themselves. It's the Asahi Garas Company. Um, but they're in so many businesses now that discern, they decided and it was always a bit more coxai techie to be kind of AGC as well. Um, sometimes we, de we do see the reverse um, ASICS and Onitska Tiger. Onitska Tiger was the uh, kind of the original brand. Um, and then they went into a retro line. By the way, I've I have, I'm not wearing them today, but I think I have eight pairs of Onitsuka Tiger made in Japan shoes. I'm a bit of a fetishist with them. If I'm, if I'm not wearing Todd's, I'm wearing Onitsuka Tiger, basically. Um, so, yeah, sometimes you trot out the original name uh, because it has this brand narrative kind of advantage. And so this is a really important aspect of entrepreneurship too. More and more, we don't like big faceless companies, uh, big organizations. We actually like to personalize businesses. So the story of the founding of the business and the founder becomes very, very important. Remember human beings, the psych, you know, human psychology is we really like to connect at the individual level. You know, we started out as cave men and women, um, kind of grunt to get each other. Uh, and from that build a civilization. So very small groups coming together, you know, to hunt down a woolly mammoth and kill it and to share the, share the benefits. Uh, so our brains are kind of hardwired to give personal attributes. So we tend to project personality even onto large organizations and in branding we do this. So putting your founder front and center is a key branding strategy now. So if you have a founder, uh, a personality um, who constantly gets media attention, it's really valuable. And that interview online, you can see that with Richard Branson, he's explicitly asked this, you know, is this really you? Um, or are you just doing this for the brand attention? And he made that nice comment that actually people in Virgin Airlines, um, the risk management, the branding people said, it's not a good idea with you flying around in balloons and crashing into the sea and stuff like that. That's, that's not a good look actually, um, if you're running an airline. So it's more about what he does. Now looking down some of the names, some of the others, Steve, my mate Steve, remember Steve Jobs, Masao Shison, very, very interesting case for someone from a minority background, um, Korean, Japanese, a real, in some sense, an outsider doing a lot of interesting things. Okay. Ah, I've really got to do some more research on this. A few of these folks I don't know. This this why it's so good here. Um, right. Um, Walt Disney ripped off so often the case. Um, ah, uh, Roland. Yep. Um, okay. Mark Cuban. Yep. Uh, da, da, da. Grammarly business. Yes. Interesting characters. Okay. Uh, Maisar son. A lot of people have picked up on them. Okay. Oh, I've, yeah, I've, I've really got to learn about some of these folks. I'm sorry, I don't know all of them. Mikitani San. I literally ran into Miki, Mikitani San in the elevator in um, Building 11, where I am, but uh, you guys can't be. I was rushing to go actually to this class, Interaction Business. I rushed in. Went, oh, God, oh, oh, Mikitani, Mikitani San was going. He goes, oh, that's okay. Uh, so he um, had the advantage of having gone to study in the States, good English, and was seeing what was happening with business developments in the US with the dot-com boom and whatnot. And I think that's a very interesting point. You guys, all of you, because you are kind of boundary spanning people, you're, you're, you're seeing other worlds, are in a much better position to be entre entrepreneurial. Many of the pioneers of venture in Japan 
in the 1990s and 2000s actually had lived abroad um, who, or who went to INTA um, because they had kind of one foot in other worlds and particularly they could see what was working well in the US. And it's uh, when we talked about you know, business development early on in the course, they said one way to do well in business is to just take something that works elsewhere and bring it to Japan. That's also, by the way, I'm, I'm a little bit cautious when students say they want to work for venture in Japan because a lot of those businesses arose at a time just really copying successes elsewhere, not necessarily having so much substance. Also, many of those venture grew up at a time when there were lots of people looking for a job and it was very much a buyer's market, an employer's market. Now it's the reverse. And so some of those venture can be quite black. You want to be careful on that. So thank you so much for sharing all of those instances. I'm going to enjoy um, over the weekend reading up on some. Uh, Rihanna, okay, interesting. Um, actually, that's, it is very interesting point that people increasingly, if they have a public persona, and it can be a digital persona, can leverage their following into business opportunities. My son, nine-year-old son, uh, follows the YouTuber Hikakin, and he's got various channels on YouTube. And I've noticed that Hikakin's you know, doing all these kind of collaborations. He's, he's doing with Baby Star Ramen and a whole bunch of things. So he's become very good at managing his franchise. And a lot of established businesses want to associate themselves with him. So there's no reason why you can't do this. I, I know of a first year student in um, another college here in Tokyo who is a first year student, he's 18, a uh, YouTuber with um, 250,000 followers, which is pretty cool to get when you're still in high school, okay? Uh, so you can really leverage your um, profile here. Okay, um, a final thing is that a large proportion of the people we're seeing identified uh, a little bit kind of outsiders, you know, Elon Musk born in, in uh, South Africa ends up heading the company that uh, is the first um, private provider, the outsource provider of rocket services to NASA. That really is quite an astonishing thing. It says something about um, America and its openness. And we often have bad images of America in terms of its openness, but it does. And I just say finally, as an Australian, that in some sectors in Australia, without migrants, nothing would have happened. That all of the large construction, all of the large construction companies in Australia were founded by often very talented migrants. They were typically engineers who had left war devastated Europe, migrated to Australia, post-war boom, built these you know, really quite amazing uh, companies. And uh, those societies that are able to open themselves up to talent, entrepreneurial talent, uh, can really flourish. And a final point on this is that it's often not the nation as a whole, it's often cities within a nation. The uh, case of Berlin is very interesting. Berlin's strategic branding as a place now is that they really want to be the kind of freelancer hub of Europe. They're trying to attract people, uh, digital nomads who can work anywhere, come and base yourself in Berlin. They have a one-stop shop on, on how to set up, become a resident of Berlin and to work out of Berlin and to bring your can do it anywhere kind of business to Berlin. Um, and then there's issues about how the cities relate to the nation and whatnot. And we had a nice post uh, from James asked about Israel. Um, uh, effectively, Tel Aviv and Haifa are incredibly entrepreneurial pockets in an otherwise very kind of complex society. And we'll see this in a lot of places. So, okay, thank you so much. Um, if you don't have a class afterwards, I suggest you go and enjoy the last of the sun. Um, work up your tan, okay? And particularly uh, sun and vitamin E are very important to boost your immune system. So in the interests of not getting COVID-19, go and work on your suntan for a little bit. Not too much so you don't get skin cancer, okay? Um, but enjoy. And I'll leave the meeting open just for a little bit longer if anyone needs to speak to me about anything. And also, uh, if you still haven't posted your favorite entrepreneurs and details, please do so. So thank you very much. And um, I will send you an email or a message through Moodle when I've 
formed the groups and finalized the group uh, task. And my apologies for the delay on that. Okay, thank you. Cheers, guys.